Assalamu alaikum, run things rude way. Nabil Aziz, becoming the alpha Muslim.com. And welcome to the second episode of the Becoming the Alpha Muslim podcast. It's been a while. I've been looking for an appropriate guest to stay within the theme of this website. I had actually an idea for a post, uh, and I thought maybe I could make a podcast out of it. And the idea I had was, have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons type role-playing games, either Tabletop or Baldur's Gate or Neverwinter Nights? There's a character archetype called the Fighting Monk or the Warrior Monk. And I sort of thought to myself, can we do that in real life? Can we engineer a warrior monk? And the reason why I'm interested in doing that is because I have three children now, I have my, my daughters, and I sort of have this idea in my head of them being warrior scholars or warrior poets. So we have that, you know, archetype in, you know, when you think <coughs> about the samurai and things like that. And when I thought about this idea, one person came to mind. I follow him on Twitter. Uh, his name is Edward Ashley Lattimore III. He's a professional boxer, but that's not the only reason why I invited him on the show. He's much, much more than that. I'll let him introduce himself. Edward, how are you doing? Doing well, doing well. How are you? Fine, thank you. Could you introduce yourself to the audience? You know, who are you? Where are you from? What are you about? What's your deal? I'm Ed Lattimore, uh, or Edward Ashley Lattimore III, if you want to use the full name. <laughs> and uh, I'm a professional boxer, record 13 and 1. I'm also in school for physics, and I love to write my blog at Lattimore.com. I write about, I guess if you wanted to theme it, it'd be self improvement. But to me, it is a reflection of my experiences in life and. And trying to take some type of actionable lesson from them, which I guess is a way for anyone who reads it to improve their self. So I guess it is self-improvement. But uh, for me, it's just an outlet for me to, to chronicle my experiences in life and hopefully someone can get something from them. Yes. So that's that's really that's a good starting off point. So you're a you're a professional boxer. You're in you're in college right now. I think you're a double major. Is that is that it, or did you drop? I was a double major, and I was just discussing this uh, with a guy today to explain it. Um, I decided to switch and focus solely on physics, and and there are a lot of reasons. Uh, I was physics and an electrical engineer, and then I decided to go just to physics. It's not like I took the easy route. Both of those are are. <laughs> rather trying majors uh but there there are lots of reasons why i decided to do just physics i guess if you wanted to take the biggest piece of the paw i like the freedom of work titles i can take on as a physicist if i have to work and, and the way it makes me think i also am <laughs> 20 credits shy of my physics degree versus a full like 50 or 60 towards my engineering and i i want i mean i'm a, i'm an adult student in school man i i just want to say i have a degree and it's not a slouch degree it's not like I, I did a bunch of credits and got a communications degree no offense to anyone that has one. just know that i'm gonna make a lot more money than you or your, but you know, african-american <laughs> studies degree or your gender studies yeah degree. or something something <laughs> with studies in it right i just wanted to get to you know the next phase as i call it the next life and i put a you know i wasted a lot of time but but once i got things on rolling i mean i want things to happen quickly because i'm 31 but i also gotta remember man i've only been in school three years and i'm all that and it takes four years to finish a physics degree so here we go so uh things moving along i'll have that degree even with the semesters i the semester I took off to focus on fighting, I'll still have it within a year, so I'll be right on right on time. And before you were you 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 went into university, you were in the Army Reserve, was it? Yes. And that helped uh, you pay for college. Helped me pay for college and helped me figure out what I wanted to do exactly. Originally, I was going to go study math, 
but uh, I, I came in in the military occupational specialty of land combat electrical systems repairer. And part of that training, I was like, man, I really want to be an electrical engineer. And then I went and started taking a class for electrical engineering. And the, I took physics. And I was like, yo, this is like math. Magic, the closest thing to magic I'll ever see. <laughs> I want to study this instead. It just so happens that I live in a in a city with a university that had a dual. It was a it's a dual degree program, physics and electrical engineering. So it was on pace anyway. But now I'm going to focus just on the physics and get that degree and uh, maybe return to like grad school for electrical engineering, but maybe not. Who knows? Right, right, right. And you're also. Uh uh, a writer, a blogger, and a, I guess now a published author. And what I notice is that writing is a craft for you. It's not like a side hobby that you just do for fun. You actually take it quite seriously. Oh, not only do I take it seriously, a lot of people don't notice. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give the listeners and any of our fans checking us out a, a little peek behind the scenes. So, so I think right now the blog has about. Uh, I'll have to count, but I want to say somewhere near 70 posts. But a lot of people don't realize that a lot of these posts, man, I wrote years ago. And and likewise, I have stuff written for the future as well. Uh, I just I do so much writing and I never throw away anything that I write. I got files from stuff 10 years ago that I wrote that I'll never do anything with. Right. It, there's just. But, but it's there. I just like to see how I've come along and, and know that I took something. I took an idea and made it reality, right? Which is what writing is. It's like alchemy in that in that way. Changing an idea into a physical manifestation. So, so my writing for me is, yeah, it's not just a side hobby, man. And it's, it's, as far as side hobbies go, I mean, I don't think I really have any. I, karaoke. I like singing karaoke. <laughs> And for me, a hobby is anything where I have decided that I am content with my level of ability. Because I, maybe I'm a unique bird, or maybe there's some other guys like this out there. But but I don't know how to just do something for fun. Mm. You know, I gotta. If once I decide I'm gonna do it, for me, it is a competitive endeavor with myself, not other people. I mean, I am going to always try. I mean, I I didn't put. Like I'm not, I'll never be a pro chess player, right? Right. I'll probably put like five hundred bucks into that hobby because I want to be the best chess player I could be, right? Mm. <laughs> and it's, for example, you know, and same with writing. You know, I want to be. I want you can see the evolution of my blog. I don't know how long you've been following it, mm. but before it started out as this WordPress site, I didn't even own my name, right? Yeah. Then I owned my name. It was still ran on WordPress. And then a guy approached me about up in, up in the quality of my, my site and was, do you want to go for that? And I was like, let's do it. And in the writing, I originally had no plans whatsoever to put out these uh, these books and things. But I'm like, let's just keep writing and keep getting better. And now I answer stuff on Quora and I'm, I'm somewhat active on Reddit and I've started to write on LinkedIn. I just, I like writing and I, I think it's very important that no matter whatever strength you think you have, or that's quantitative or, or what words, you got to be able to communicate. And I think writing helps that. I've seen your answers on Quora. I didn't know that you write on LinkedIn. Uh, and what's your, your which sub forums do you write on Reddit? Uh, Reddit, the getting better forum mostly. Sub, uh, sub forum, the getting better Reddit. Okay. And your, your yeah. handle is uh, Ed Lattimore? Yes, I think I'll have to check, but I'm pretty sure it's Ed Lattimore. Yeah, because I, I mean, my memory is terrible. I got the same password for everything. I got the <laughs> same. Pretty much, if I can't, I can go back to something that I signed up for ten years ago, and I know three passwords. It could be, and it's always one of those. So, so I'm pretty sure it's Ed Lattimore on Reddit. But I haven't posted on Reddit maybe a month, so I have to check and see. Maybe well, not that long. Yeah, little little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you probably getting punched in the head too many times as well, right? <laughs> yeah, man. It's tough business. <laughs> Very yeah. tough. I yeah. wouldn't boxing is, is is a weird beast because of the way it's set up financially. You kinda have to okay, you can't it's too serious to approach like a hobby. Anyone yeah. that's doing boxing is a hobby, 
is lying or stupid or both. We <laughs> cannot do this sport at the professional level as a hobby. Mm. Now, as an amateur, I th- I think there is some. I think it's set up to be that way. You can do it as kind of a southern, but the minute you decide you're going to compete for money, huh? No way. This is the, the guys are in there competing for money. You're in there fighting with guys that got they got families and shit to feed, man. And and when you have a a reason to work and and your job is to hurt people, you are in a bad place if you're in there and you're not serious about right. I mean the boxing, not the right. So uh, as far as as far as like getting hit in the head goes. Man, I know that if I don't if I don't put the right time, man, I gotta I gotta leave him behind. Otherwise, I'll get seriously hurt. Right, exactly. Because you, you're both. I mean, you're a heavyweight, and you're both trying to hurt each other, and you're both trying to actively knock the shit out of each other. Absolutely, <laughs> you know. And it is not. It's like my last fight. My last fight, I lost. I got stopped. It's important. I always, you know, my my ego gets involved yeah. a little bit. For me, it's important to say I got stopped and not knocked out because when you get stopped, it's a TKO. Yeah. Knockout is like you're they're picking you up off the canvas. You ain't leaving on your own two feet. Right. I got stopped. Uh, well, people got to remember uh, about heavyweight boxing. I take nothing away from my opponent or anything, but hey, this is why it's, that's why heavyweight boxing is great. When two men are over two hundred pounds throwing leather. One mistake, man, and I made a mistake, yeah. <laughs> and you get hit, and boom, and you're like, "What the?" Because you know, it's funny. I, during the fight, the, the 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 shot that put me down didn't hurt. I wasn't like, "Well, I wasn't disoriented." It was just forced, and I was off balance, and it was strong enough to. I was like, "Whoa!" And then you know, the second time, I think the second time was like a really was it was a was a more effective shot. But it's a it's a serious game. Yeah. Serious game, and it, it, I, I I hesitate to call it a game. Football is a game, soccer is a game, boxing. Man, I just I cannot in good conscience call a sport where your goal, you know, if if all goes well, right? Yeah, no one gets hurt. Yeah, but if someone gets hurt, you win. I mean, that's that's yeah. part of the rule. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't know this. You got to sign a waiver before the fight that says, "Yo, if you die in there, ain't sure you could do, man. Your family yeah. just." We ain't sending them no money. Yeah. We, ain't, we ain't paying for your burial expenses. You done, man. You yeah. just the, the machine chewed you up and spit you out. <laughs> yeah. And I wanna I wanna sort of visit the psychology of that loss because you wrote about that for us. But we'll do, you you wrote about that, but we'll do that a little bit uh, later on in the interview. Do you think that you uh-huh. know um, the referee actually stopping the fight saved you from getting you know knocked knocked out completely? Is is, is do they? Stop the fight to you know, still, prevent you from getting hurt. I'm still at the point where I haven't watched it yet. You know, it's like it's like a breakup, man. Where you where you're not at the point where you can look at photos of your ex yet. <laughs> I can look at you know I've looked at the, the 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 still shots of the shot and I know how I felt when I got hit. And I've been wrong in the ring before, right? I know what it what it feels like to have your balance disoriented to be sitting there on Queer Street and to work through it. I think the ref, I, I think the, the stoppage is fine. I don't have a problem with the stoppage. I think if I was a little higher ranking, he would have let it go on, mm. right? Or we were not in Oklahoma, he would have let it go on. Mm. But but when you when you drop a guy twice in one round. It becomes very hard to justify as a referee. Like if I got hurt, right? It becomes very hard to justify with a ref when he's in front of the board or whatever, and they're asking him about the decision. Is I'm sending a coma or something? He don't. There, there's not a way to say, "Well, I thought he was gonna fight through it," right? Yeah. So just, uh, uh, just- I, I don't have a problem with how to defend the game. Yeah. So just to for for people who are you know, who don't who are not your followers and who are just listening for the first time, could you explain exactly what happened uh, during the you know the, the the fight that led to you know you getting stopped? In, in uh, summary, I, the summary. I was fighting. I was fighting well. Technically, well, he was a he was much better composed than we thought it would be. I think. And I was not as composed as I should have been. In other, and and I point that out because I was fighting the better fight. 
but he was not receiving. His focus state laser was very impressive. I think he'll do well in the sport, and he'll continue to make steam as long as he uh, keeps that composure under fire. And then he he took a, an overhand right over a shot in opening, and that was the shot, the first one that uh, put me down. The second one, I think, came over my guard. Maybe I haven't looked at looked at it, but I know the first one came over my jab. Because when you're taller and if it's a, if it's not a perfectly technical, is if it's not technically correct, there are openings there, and a, a taller guy, it's easier to manipulate those openings. And uh, I had been having trouble leading up to that fight with the perfecting my technique with the jab, making sure that there's no gaps between my my chin and my shoulder. And if you have those gaps, a, a taller guy with a good right hand, and he's got a great right hand, will be able to come down and hit you there. So uh, that's that's what happened. That is pretty much. I don't. I mean, in terms of skill level, I think. Well, I mean, we will never know, right? But in terms of power, he got the great. He got a great uh a shot in and it hit me and it was a good shot. Boom. I mean, I, I was fine afterwards. Like I wasn't disoriented, but but the name of the game is you can only have two services on the ground, and I put three down. <laughs> so which is my hand, right, yeah. or my knee or whatever. Yeah, the right, shots. Right. Right. So. Okay, so let's move on to uh, the topic of discussion. Uh, f- for the listeners, for those of you who don't know, uh, the warrior monk is an archetype in uh, a role playing game. Basically, it's a character that you can play that has certain abilities. The warrior monk is known for uh, fighting with his bare hands, so no weapons, and he doesn't wear armor. He starts out really weak, and as the game progresses, he becomes much, much more powerful to the extent that his um, his unarmed strikes become more powerful than you know uh, weapon strikes, and he becomes so agile that he he doesn't need to wear armor. So basically, he can dodge base all, almost every strike, and he becomes <laughs> almost immune to, immune to magic. So my idea for this particular show was. To see if we can take some of those characteristics, uh, not just the physical characteristics, but the mental and spiritual characteristics, and transpose them into a human being. So, you know, Ed, what do you what do you think about that? Uh, uh, first of all, I really like that description. That that was a bit of a psychotherapy for me, man. I, I'll tell you later about that. But that, but that was that was awesome. Uh, someone who starts out really weak and then eventually becomes super powerful. I mean, and that's exactly what happens in the game. Yeah. And the reason they can do that, thing we can take, is because they affect the system from themselves. You, you, they change themselves to match the reality. But in doing that, and then making that change, and then training their body, and training their mind, and training their emotions, their environment is forced to respond to them because they're doing it in tune, in accord to the environment. They aren't. It's like uh, trying to create a weapon that that takes from the planet, right? You can make all the steel weapons you want. Eventually, you'll run out of steel. You're depleting the planet. You're working against the planet's natural reserves, right? But if you learn to strike and move with the planet, if you learn to use gravity to angle your strikes down, or you learn to use the power of your mind the way you learn naturally as opposed to overdosing on no tropics or trying to cram on cram on information, if you learn to use the the uh, the tendencies of a human being in your negotiation and your emotional rapport as opposed to trying to force a situation. I always say negotiation is or rather that uh, force and intimidation is what you rely on where you can't negotiate. Negotiation is very much a harmony. It's how can we help you help me so we can all get something. This is the idea of a warrior monk. Like if you, if you were to break it down, take all those examples and take the key idea. The idea is that the warrior monk makes the environment a reflection of himself instead of making himself a reflection of his environment. It's a very it's a very strange concept uh, of the people that people 
to wrestle with. I don't try to, I mean, if things are really, really stressful, obviously I have to do some kind of adaptation to what I see. But for the most part, I am trying to grow and adapt. And a lot of times it might seem like, it might it may seem like I'm not taking the right path. I'm making the right steps. But I'm doing what I know is true to me and is in accord with how I see the world, my values, and what's important to me. So eventually, as long as I stick with it and I'm disciplined and I learn and I learn and I learn and I stay true to myself, then I get to a position where and I, because I've gotten there the right way. I haven't gotten them making shady deals or screwing people over or stealing or hurting. I've got to the right way in accord with nature and accord to myself and what I hold true. I am way more probable. It is what well, I was just talking about, the power of being likable. When you get to a position because of the hard work you do and the contributions you make and the content of your character, you are very safe in that position. If you get to that position because you know somebody – or because you scratch somebody's back, or because you screwed somebody over, you are not safe in that position, and you want to be able to sleep well. It's like it's like you got a million dollars in a bank. You either got that million dollars from a from a contribution you made to the world, or you stole it. Who's going to sleep better at night, even though they got a million dollars, right? And that those are extreme examples. But but when I think about the monk, and why, like I was thinking about Final Fantasy Tactics and that guy. Starts out very weak. The first thing he learns how to do is how to work with the earth to hit a god far away. Right? <laughs> Instead yeah. of getting a gun, it would be a lot easier to, to take some bullets, mold that steel. We can't put the, 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 the bullet from the steel back in the planet. It's just gone. No. He figures out how to use the earth to work with him. And so what happens eventually? All the poisons that come from the earth can't even hurt him. Like... This is some, like, next-level dork shit for all the people listening. I mean, this is, like, hardcore nerd. But I hope I'm making it mainstream enough to, to where the idea is able to be grasped. When you do things correctly and in harmony but true to yourself, you will arrive at positions where you are stronger and stable than anyone else that gets there. And, if people, and, and here's the other cool thing. If someone gets to that position in life because they – they did the right things, then you're only going to work in harmony. You're not going to, they're not going to be gunning for you. They're going to be looking for ways for you both to elevate. So it's a win-win. The important thing is to do things right. Yeah. So that's interesting because I remember that strike. Uh, it's the earth strike and it's like the earth comes <laughs> up from underneath the guy, right? Uh, in Final Fantasy yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a rain strike as well. Yeah, I remember that. So... Uh, and that's interesting because you, you mentioned that you're sort of staying true to yourself and you're focusing on your own self-improvement. I notice a lot that you don't uh, you don't speak about, you know, politics like some of the other, um, you know, people that we follow on Twitter uh, too much. You rather you, yeah. you speak about uh, focusing on your own circle of influence and your own community and trying to improve those things, um, you know, I guess organically. And I also yeah. noticed that when you talk about you know self improvement and max masculinity, you talk it you talk about it from a self contained perspective rather than uh, from the perspective of you know femininity. Is that something that's uh, you know that that makes sense to you? Um, yeah, and once again, that that whole perspective is is congruent, right? So, like for the community. I don't care about politics because no matter who's in office, that's not going to change my responsibilities and the contributions I have to make to what's around me. So what's around me works well and the people around me work well. If everyone took that approach that I'm going to just make my sphere of influence the best it can be and as, as helpful as it can be to my fellow man, then, then it, it – literally wouldn't matter who's president i mean it wouldn't we would be too concerned with making ourselves the best versions of ourselves right and that's what i want to do i want to make my community reflect me mm. i can't go out here and tell people not to not to do drugs if i'm a crackhead right right on, on the base so so if i want a drug-free community right then i gotta be drug-free if i want a community free 
of violence, I can't go knock off the liquor store, right? And we're talking about extreme obvious examples, but let's take it one step further and be more subtle. Let's say I want a community that honors the nuclear family because I know the, the difference between a single mother household and how detrimental that can be versus one where both parents are around. I can't live a life where I'm out here chasing all types of loose women. I won't be congruent in the values and the things I say. No one could take me seriously. I couldn't take myself seriously. I couldn't deliver the message with the right amount of uh, with with the right fever. I couldn't. I couldn't inspire you <laughs> to perhaps follow a life that's going to lead to the betterment of the community. If I'm doing things that won't lead to the betterment of the community, if taken to the extreme, taken to the long term, if applied to everyone, right? Same way with my views on masculinity. It is not, I do not believe that, and I th- and it's terrible it's become this way. So much of what's written out there, so much of our perspective on interacting with the opposite sex, it's almost like a battle. It's like a battle of the sex, and it shouldn't be a battle, man. We got to cooperate. Mm-hmm. So, so I don't, I never, I don't, I don't want to say never, because maybe I slipped up and there's a tweet out there somewhere. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> So, the so trolls will find it and vilify me. <laughs> the, the trolls will find it and vilify and hang me up by it. But, but the point is, I want to write about becoming the best possible man. Because I really believe that if you do that and you hold everyone else in your circle of influence accountable, then you're going to attract the best possible woman. And then that will serve as an example for the rest of the community and they will attract the best possible people. And by attracting the best possible people, you force everyone to raise their level and their contribution to the world. So I can't I can't get caught up in politics. I just it'll never interest me. Like it it'll never it'll I, I can say that for sure. I, I never say never. I can say unless my unless what I want out of life changes completely and I'm like, all right, I got some money, maybe I'll go run for office to clean some up. But even still, I'd much rather work within my community with that effort and, and use that as a beacon. Like, hey, look what we're doing here. Come learn from us. Take it to your side of the community. Let, is, let's make – even – like I got this dream in my mind. Like I would get involved in politics if I worked from the ground up and I was the mayor of my city. And I could show everyone I was the example of what my city can be and why – we are that way because of a mentality that I, I started as a seed that I was able to spread around to everyone else. Right. And and you were sort of like, we can think about your Twitter as sort of a microcosm of that, right? So you want a high quality Twitter, so you will only follow high quality accounts rather than the strategy of, you know, just following random people. And then your Twitter uh, content is sort of, themed around a particular sort of theme that you only attract a certain kind of following. Right. Right, right. You know, and and it it blew my mind. For a while, I had misconceptions about who was following me, right? I thought I was followed by by a certain group or a certain type. And uh, I I put out a a poll or something about who they voted for. I was surprised. I mean... I think I think like 40, 35, 40 percent of my my followers are voting for Hillary. I thought most of them were voting for Trump, but that's that is not a political play from my end. It's just what I see based on who I follow back and what what I'm able to kind of guess about the commonalities of people that who are who are Trump supporters versus people who and what they see in me and and what draws them to me. But uh, I think. I think because what I say and how I think, and I'll use politics to make examples perhaps, but but back to my way of seeing the world, that transcends a political ideology. I really believe that. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong about that, <laughs> but I don't want to be wrong about that, so I if I see myself now, now if someone looks at a way I think and go, that's clearly a, a libertarian idea, or that's clearly a Republican idea, that's their assessment. I didn't choose it because it's that. Mm. I chose it because I believe it will help. It, you know, no one's got the right answer. The one hundred percent right answers. Right? If you, if you take a little bit from everyone, hopefully you get a little closer. Yeah. 
And that's that's interesting because that whole sort of stream of thought that we just went through right now, uh, in the Islamic tradition, that's exactly how we're supposed to do it. First, we fix ourselves, then we fix our families, then we fix the community around us, and then it goes. It's like a it's like a ripple. It uh, you throw look a, if, a pebble exactly into a if you stop. If if you stopped right at the family part, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Everything would be good, right? If everybody it's just one, it's, it's one generation. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And that's like so we we got. Yeah, I mean that's like that's like you know explicitly sort of written in our scripture and tradition, you know. So you know, if, if for example, like if everybody just took, just like you mentioned right now, if everybody just took care of their own their, their themselves and their own families. In a generation, we'd all be good, right? <laughs> we we would be better than good. I mean, it would there, there'd be so much that could be accomplished, but 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 you know, human nature is human nature, and and the best parts of us come with the worst parts. Mm. There's and you know we, and I believe that too. The best and worst things walk hand in hand in life. I really think that is the, that's the duality of the universe. Mm. So our our goal eventually, and this is a bit esoteric, jumping into the spiritual realm. I think I think our goal in life is to kind of move beyond duality. Whether we achieve that goal or not is irrelevant. But the point is to get past. It's like they they talk about this a lot in Buddhism. I don't know if there's a, a an equivalent in in the Islamic tradition, I know there's somewhat of an equivalency in Christianity. The idea is um, is that life is suffering, right? They, they talk about in Buddhism. But the only way to get over suffering is to get past attachment. But the subtle key there is to get past uh, attachment. You got to give up what makes you sad and happy. So you can't, right? So so we gotta. It's like there's no light without darkness. The best parts of us come with the worst parts of us. We want to try and mitigate the worst parts and highlight the best, but we're human. No one's perfect, but we can start and do something somewhere. And I really believe starting ourselves and those closest to us, that is the best place to start right out of the jump. And then everything else improves. Yeah, so it, I mean, the closest thing in the Islamic tradition is that we live our lives as as though we are a traveler and we're just uh, you know a, a temporary in this life. So um, everything you know and everything that happens to us, we believe is is good for us and we're grateful. So anything bad that happens to us, it's something that you know that's a test that we have to pass. And anything that good that happens to us, it's a you know a blessing and that we're grateful for that. So and then the attachment part. Again, we sort of supposed to be detached from a material, uh, you know, the material pleasures. Even though we use them for our purposes, it doesn't uh, become, you know, a physical or a mental or a spiritual attachment to those things. I think that's the closest thing yeah. that we have. So let's, for example, let's say now we want to engineer one of these warrior monks. Where do we start? Uh, how how early can we get them? Let's let's <laughs> let's let's say like okay, let's take the example of my girls. Okay, my girls are five, three, and one. Okay, let's take the oldest one because she's gonna have to start, you know, um, learning some of these things. How would we how would we start? We gotta somehow make sure that the warrior monk, the child in training, fully understands. Delay gratification, so so important. So many. I mean, you, you can get a lot of things wrong in life if you get the big things right, right? But get one of the big things wrong, and many of the other things you get right won't matter. I think I might tweet that later. Uh, but <laughs> so, and, and one of the things you have to get is that. You have to take a long-term time consideration into everything you do. You, it cannot be about what is next, what is next, what will make me feel better now, because that will never... Because hard work doesn't feel good now. It always has to be about what you will get later. Controlling your emotions when you first do it does not feel good now. What, feel, what feels good now is giving in to the, the tantrum. 
or they're yelling or hitting the guy that, that, that cut you off or yelling, you know, or cut you off or something. That feels good now. They have to get in their mind, get in their being, their very essence, the delayed gratification. Once you get that, then we can move to the next phase, and that is figure out a way to make everyone happy. I don't know if win-win always exists, but win-win is present in a lot more situations than people think. When you approach it from the perspective that both parties or all parties involved can benefit, then you start seeing the problem differently. You start looking at solutions differently. Your solutions aren't always so, all right, so we got to do this. So that guy's got to suffer. It's, well, we don't have to get so much so this guy can move up. Because you know what happens when you do that, when you approach with a win-win, it automatically, one, it makes you just better at uh, anything that you have to deal with with people, but it automatically puts in your mind a global consciousness. And I know we talked about controlling and uh, fixing what's close to you. That's really important. But it also is equally important to be able to, to see the effect that that is going to have on the world. It's one thing if I tell you, man, just take care of your family, forget everybody else out there, right? Mm. Uh, That's like the C-minus answer. Like, it's good enough to pass the class, but, man, that's terrible. What's better is you should take care of your family because that will put your family in a better position to be an asset to the world, not a liability to the world, right? Nobody wants to give birth to a serial killer. Everyone wants to give birth to the next Nobel Prize winner, right? That's how that works. And you can only do that by make, or rather you can increase the odds that that will happen by providing a strong, structured environment. So you want to take care of your people. But you do that with the mindset of this will make, Everyone in life better. So you want to delay gratification and you want to instill in them a global consciousness. You've got to be aware of how what you do will affect the world. And once you have those two things, I think the last thing, the last idea, if I was to like make a trifecta, I mean, we could go on forever, right? Mm-hmm. But but the, the last thing that is super important is you have to understand that the universe is impersonal and it is not coming to save you. So it is up to you to be the change you want done in the world. I guess, I guess if I was to add a mirror to that, yeah, be the change you want in the world. But if you want something done, you got to do it. You know, a lot of people look for systems or rules, et cetera, to save them. And rules are all good. Rules are great if everyone takes care of their home first and no one's out killing these other breaking the law mm. but you gotta prepare for the fact that in the impersonness of the or the impersonality of the universe that some people ain't gonna care it's, you know and it's just it's just how it is you know it, we, we have these ideals and that's what they are they're ideals and an ideal often uh, is what you're striving for the real thing the way people really live the way people really act They're not always ideal, and you can't plan for the ideal because that's the strategy of hope, and hope is the worst strategy. Mm. So so the whole point, delay gratification, global consciousness. Remember, the universe is impersonal, which means if bad stuff happens, do not take it personal. Just prepare for the fact that bad stuff probably will happen, even if the first two things are going on. Those are ideals, remember. Mm. And lastly, you have to take care of Everything you want done yourself. Could you imagine the world we would have if we could get people to get those four ideas? Those four, you would never hurt another person if we got people to get those four ideas. You would raise incredible family members. People would do incredible things if they approach life and thought about things from that perspective. Well, if I do this, am I, am I trying to just make myself feel better now? All right, check. Does this help the world become better? Yes, yes it does. Check. Okay. Mm-hmm. It, will this use my energy and effort and not rely on other people to push me? Am I not being a mooch? Am I not being lazy? Am I not being uh I can't even remember that word. Uh am, am I not leeching yeah. off the world around me and people's goodwill? None of that. Check. Okay. And if this doesn't go well, am I going to take responsibility and see how I can learn or am I gonna blame the universe for singling me out? 
I don't think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna learn from it and keep getting better. Check. Boom. There's no that. Those are big things, right? Those are big things that if you get right, all the other little stuff. Eh, some of them you get wrong. Some of them you get right. But you won't make any big crazy decisions. Even even the even the even something like you do something practical like like a DUI. Let's say you get a DUI and you crash your car and you get all these. You're going to do some time. You hurt somebody's life. And uh, it's going to cost you a lot of money. You would never do that, though, if you sat and looked at it and went, all right, well, I can drink. That's one of those, like, little things, right? But the big thing, will me getting behind the wheel of this car make my world a better place or a worse place? Mm. You look at that, and someone reminds you, yo, you're going to put a lot of bad out in the world potentially if you do this. Ooh. Someone else said it again to me. Now, and someone else said it to you because everyone else is thinking that way. Now you prevent yourself from doing that. I mean, but these are ideals, right? That obviously, you know, in hindsight, when you're sober and a drunk take, you're like, I shouldn't have done that. But these are ideals to strive for. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really important point because uh, in, in our tradition, uh, in the Quran, it says, God does not change the condition of a people until they change that which is within themselves. Yes, 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 yeah, man. I can't remember where I seen another version of that. Uh, I oh, it's, but, it's, but the yeah. saying is, "God helps those who help themselves." It's all, and a, yeah. It's all, uh, it's all sort of self improvement or you know self accountability. All of these movements that are happening now, like uh, one thing I noticed with the, with the black people is that they have hotep. And Hotep yeah. is all about that. And you, every time they talk about, you know, Hotep type principles, that verse from the Quran keeps, uh, you know, uh, you know, in my, it keeps playing in my head. And I've actually tweeted that out to like Handyman and um, and, and 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 a few of these other guys, and they they were quite receptive yeah. to it because it's it's that's what it's about, right? Very much, because and, and you know, on, on a on a side note, this is the. Uh, this is the, the the problem. While we will always have, until a major change is made, while we we'll always have these movements like uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, I, and I, I, the heart is in the right place. It really is. The mind and the intent is not. Why is that? Because okay, so Hotep and Black Lives Matter are are in a clash, right? And they, but they shouldn't be. But what is the real clash? Because Hotep's whole principle, Hotep's whole, you get past the little stuff, right? Like maybe views on homosexuality, that's like little stuff. Mm. The big stuff, self-sufficiency. Yeah. There's no one coming to save you. The universe doesn't care. self And because of that, you got to make sure your whole area is right. Mm. Compare that to the whole message of Black Lives Matter. We are victims our lives matter. Ho, um, Bob Hodge just wrote about this, how it's a victim of mentality. And the biggest clash is that is that it's incentivized. They've actually taken victimhood, the system we have in this country, and incentivized it. Mm. You know, I can't tell you how many people I grew up with whose parents understood the system. If I have more children, I get more welfare. Mm. It's crazy, right? If I do this, I get these benefits. If you do that, you won't get benefits, or maybe I won't do that. And by I do that, I mean like take a slightly higher paying job or go to school, things like that. It's a mess, and they've incentivized it to no end. You know. And what I've noticed is that by watching um, these people, Black Lives Matter, and you know the other progressive movements and the other sort of victim mindset movements. Uh, Muslims being in a position where they're sort of facing a bit of, you know, facing a hard time in America are sort of emulating those, um, that language, those tactics, that victim mindset in order to get more, I guess, eyeballs on themselves or more attention or more, you know, more, you know. That attention is, that. is incentive. It's all incentive. And, and I think the worst thing, I was having an argument with a guy about this. And he was saying, that, like, you don't get the Black Lives Matter movement. We're not because because that's the counter. We should clean up our own streets. Right. Which which the side I'm on is opposed to 
worrying about police brutality. And and what the guy couldn't understand, what I kept trying to say to him, he was saying Black Lives Matter is about the police brutality, not brothers killing brothers. And I'm like, yeah, it's a bigger problem. No brothers killing brothers and police brutality. But the bigger thing is that the odds and the attention and the funding that Black Lives Matter has gotten to deal with such a small percentage of deaths. That is how that that that's the machine right there. Victimize I mean, incentivize this victimhood. Mm. And and because there's an incentive, more people will, will buy into it and it will take the attention away. I don't know if this is intentional or not. I'm not a full blown conspiracy theorist, mm. but it will take the attention away from the problem you could affect and the problem you could change with all of this influence. Could you imagine the the way Black Lives Matter responds to all the police students, if they responded to uh, the killings in, in Chirac, they would be, it would be a different ball game, right? South side of Chicago would be cleaned up in a year. Yeah. But instead, we focus on a few guys, you know, not a few, because I mean, all lives do matter. I mean, and I don't say that as a political statement. I mean, I understand the outrage when anyone is killed or taken from this planet earlier than they should be by causes that could have been prevented should a system had the system been different. I get that. I get that. I do. I do. I do. I am not <laughs> discarding. My main thing is, what are we actually doing to fix that? And I think, I think they are focusing in the wrong place. Uh, I think Hotep has the right idea, but because it's a movement of self sufficiency, and people like people don't like to be efficient or self sufficient. Uh, I don't. I don't think they're going to get the large traction that they need. It's the same reason why everyone in the hood still votes Democrat, but now we're talking politics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And for, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ed is actually from the hood, right? You made it out of the hood. Very much so, man. <laughs> yeah, my, my credit is, is is about as real as it comes. If you if you were listening and you decided, I'm a, you know what, I don't believe this, more. I'm going to go look at what you're going to see. I lived in the projects for 18 years. And and did all the project shit. I mean, I didn't break any laws, but but the, but the negative stuff that could happen to you, yeah, man. I'm a I'm a I'm a product right. of of that. So and, and so and people hate that. You know, people hate that uh, the that black man <laughs> from the hood has this opinion because they because now they're forced to deal with me on a logical basis. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you follow Milo back when he was on on Twitter before they they kicked him off. But but he used to say that all the time. I am gay. I am in the minority. So you can't argue with me and you just can't yell, you're straight, you don't get it. Mm. No, you gotta confront me on logic. And yeah. You can't do that. So so when I have arguments, when I say things about and for the most part I still try and stay away because because the because the, they got a clever insult for me. I'm not Uncle Tom. You know, which which is a nice clever one. Uh or right. I'm the coon. Right. Hey, which is funny, pooing Uncle Tom, all that, right? Yeah. But but all that tells me is that intellectually they have not put in the work to at least to at least have a counter argument, yeah. right? You know whether whether I'm right or wrong, that's cool. I can deal with that. But I want to be proven wrong. When you just start shouting <laughs> insults and you know, then you you know better than a kid, man. <laughs> But that's cool. That's why that's why it's pointless to discuss these things, and it is far more uh, constructive to work on just bettering yourself, staying out of dodge, bettering your community, bettering the people that you know. And if everyone does that, it, then, it, then these conversations won't even have to be had because everyone is going to be doing better. I'm going to have uh, Uncle Hotep, Handy Mayhem, on, on, on the podcast to talk about Black Lives Matter in detail, I hope. Oh, he excellent! Man, I, love, I love his podcast. Uh, and his YouTube. He's, he's funny, and he is smart. <laughs> and he's so he's got a lot of great, great observations. Stuff I didn't even. What I love about his podcast is, is uh, he'll approach an issue that I'll see floating around, right? And so I'll I'll get an opinion naturally, being a person. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll go more in depth about my opinion and I'll reach more or less a conclusion and I'll just keep it myself. But then I'll hear his take on it and he'll, well, we will both have the same, be on the same side of a fence, mm. but he'll be 
completely different because of the way he thought it analyzed. And I like I like hearing a different thought process come to the same conclusion, even if it came to a different one. Mm-hmm. I still like hearing the thought process. I mean, that, that's one thing that I noticed that, you know, and I've been actively sort of trying to tell like Muslim people because Muslim people have this idea that Black Lives Matter is like the only way to go about it. But I keep telling them that no, there's like all of these black people from the hood with the same you know background and the same lives that completely disagree or complete and are completely diametrically opposed to you know so the Black Lives Matter narrative. Um, completely, and- I mean, completely. I I think it's so bad for our community. Um, and and when I say our community, when I say it, I'm speaking not only about the black community. I'm also speaking about low income because it's weird. You can never kind of escape certain things. I still mentally identify with I'm not like shackled by it. Like I don't I don't emotionally identify with where I grew up. It, the dumb days are way over. Mm. But mentally I am who I am because of that experience and I want to see the place improve and I know it doesn't have to be that bad. And so I think about what is good for it, what is bad for it. And this whole this is very bad for for uh, that community. It is not going to help it get better. It is not going to move people out of that system. And, and I think it's bad in general for everyone's relations. I mean, I, I'm in an interracial relationship. And I think about it sometimes. Like, what would I do if somebody came up and started talking some dumb nonsense uh, to me or to my girl about our, our, our relationship. Fortunately, we live in a time where, like, you a real piece of shit if you do that. It's not like the 60s. But, I mean, you're basically asking for yeah. for, <laughs> for whatever comes to you. Yeah. But I think about that because people are nuts, man. Like, people are nuts. But, so, I don't I don't like to see a movement that, that focuses on ways to divide people. And if, as you see, as you, as you, if you track some of the headlines... That is what happens. That is the end result. Division. Like, like there was a story out in California. I can't remember the school. They were building all black dorms. I'm like, hold up. No one, no <laughs> one sees how this is going backwards. Like, they want to not bring only, back Jim Crow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, hold up. We we fought real hard. <laughs> like like real hard. Like like people died hard. Your your, your daddy marched. <laughs> to get rid so of like. This. You wouldn't have this, and now you're asking for it because you don't understand. And no one, not only do you not understand, but victimhood. Victimhood, making an incentive. Oh, we got our own dorm. Look at it. They got their own dorms. But because they don't because they don't think about what that means in a bigger context, all they see is, we got our own dorms, man. This is black people. It's about to be crazy up right here. <laughs> Insane. Insane, man. Yeah. So there's a lot of again, there's quite a few voices that I'm quite impressed by. That I mean, that at least I get I I'm sort of happy that I get the other side of the the discussion. Uh, but I want to move on now in terms of the ability to learn uh, in the context mm-hmm. of this warrior monk. How would you instill like what would you what sort of tools would you give them that would enable the ability to learn and continuously improve themselves because that's something that you know we, we, my wife and I were planning on homeschooling our kids so we want to figure Extra, out you know strong support for that yeah <laughs> exactly so what we want I want to give them the tools that they can learn anything they put their mind to what what do you what do you think how would you start that off the first thing I would do is I would get rid of their access to the internet for a while mm. um and I say that because because and that was just my, my mind going to the first thing that is the biggest distraction. But to learn effectively, the thing that made the biggest difference for me because I was a horrible math student in college. Now I'm a physics major. I mean that's night and day. Or rather, a horrible math student in high school is what I mean. Uh, ninety. The biggest difference maker was sitting there by myself, quiet, no distractions, and learning. Going over a thing, and then when I have problems, writing those problems down, learning to work through, learning to enjoy the struggle of solving a problem. 
I think I think once you get I read I read an article I can't remember who put it out, but he talked about how he was reading a boy his he was reading a story to his kid, uh, like a four year old, and and they would alternate and then his son was reading the words and he got to a word and he struggled through it. But he got it, and then he said to his father, "Aren't you happy with how I struggled through that word?" And it made his. He said it made him smile because that means he's doing a good job. His son understands that it will not be easy, but you have to work towards it. And once you learn to enjoy the work, you've done. You've taken care of so much. Mm. That's why a lot of people don't 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 think they're good at math because math is difficult, or rather, relative to talking. Math is difficult. You have to sit. You have to learn a system of a new language. Basically, you got to learn how to work with that language. It doesn't matter how you feel about the language. There's no opinions in the math and sciences. It is either is your answer correct, is it not correct, or your calculations agree, or do they not agree with your your prediction? It's very or do your prediction agree with your calculations? Um, it's very not. It's very. It's very much. Impersonal, exactly. right? Exactly, like the universe example, right? And so they, so that is what I think made a difference for me. That's why boxing is great because look, it doesn't matter how much nonsense you talk or how you feel, you got to keep your cool when you get hit and solve the problem in front of you. If you lose your cool, you start worrying about how you feel. You're not going to be effective at solving the problem in front of you, and your career will stagnate. You won't do well. Same with academics. So you have to teach. Once you get them to, to separate and get away from the distractions, and I think distractions in this day and age are big. Even when we were children, we didn't have smartphones. We didn't. I didn't have the internet in my house until. I mean, I was poor though. I didn't have the internet in my house until I was fourteen. <laughs> I know some some of my friends had it since they were like uh, middle school, but 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 even still, it was DSL, man. I mean, yeah. I, it was dial up. It wasn't yeah. what we. I'm on fire. It was internet right now, man. We it's was, just moving at the speed of light. Yeah, we was <laughs> like, uh, we was 16 when we got it. I remember, and that was that was a modem too. That was you know, it was dial up as well. Exactly, yeah. like no one could be on the phone at the same time. Yeah, it was yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man. So you got you got to put them in an environment where there are not distractions and you got to train them to not get discouraged at difficult things. And that starts very early. That is, I mean, to put it in perspective, I have it. My sister does not. And the only difference, the only difference between me and my sister is that I was through, through, I got. I spent a little extra time with my dad. My dad was very much like that. When I spent time with my, with my sister, my mom was pregnant with my sister. I went to live with my dad in Philadelphia, and he has always been like that. My sister never got exposed to that. So when she encounters hard stuff, it her response is very much not like mine, mm. right? And and most people's response to truly difficult things. That are impersonal is to give up or to say they're bad, and you have to eliminate that. Once so, that's all you need: solitude and grit. And grit, one like we were saying with the warrior monk thing. How early do you get them? We're talking about kids. You want to get them on the path of solving hard problems immediately. My girl was homeschooled, uh, and she's the same way. She had this idea for this website that she wanted to build. Never programmed a website in her life. Never did anything like that. But spent, I mean, we were talking, all, she just ignored me for some weekends. Uh, 60, 70, 80 hours on top of her job, learning how to do this. And now it's making money. Mm. So it went from an idea that she was like, I got to learn how to do this, and now it's making money. But these are the things that are really important. If, I mean, even if they weren't homeschooled, right? These will be important tools to help them learn, but they're gonna be. But when you when you uh, give those tools the steroid injection of homeschooling, because I genuinely believe that the school system, it, when you anytime you put anything on a set of rails and goes, here's the direction you have to go, and you got to pass this point and this point and this point, you'll miss all the other things off the rails that perhaps 
would make your train ride faster, more enjoyable, allow you to get to a different destination. Mm. So, so I'm, I'm just a big fan of homeschooling in general for that reason. But if you if you get those two things down, you're gonna. I mean, I really think they'll they'll be excellent. I mean, that means foreign language won't discourage them. A lot. Another thing, people get discouraged about foreign language because once again, either you're saying a thing and people understand you, or you're not. Mm. Gotta learn how to deal with it. Uh, when you but, but people go into these soft things like these liberal like a lot. Well, not all the liberal arts. You know, my girl's gonna listen to this girl. I told you about that liberal arts thing because she's a liberal arts major, but she, she's a French major. She speaks it fluently. Um, but uh, all these people are gonna like communications or gender studies or or African American studies. There's no right answer, right. so it doesn't matter how. It, like, like, so it can never get difficult. Postmodern, right? Yeah, whatever truth is, right. uh, your my truth is 100 correct, and so is yours. Which, which you know, on a, on a different note, is BS, right? Yeah. But it, it, if you never encounter something with rigor, with a correct answer, what what is an outcome that verifies your process was correct, you never learn. You you never learn how to deal with a process. Forget searching for an outcome. Mm. You know, there's a reason why math majors and physicists do better on standardized tests and get higher paying jobs. I mean, say what you want about standardized tests, right? That's not the point. The point is that they learn how to work a process because their whole life is right or wrong. That's wrong. Let me go figure out why I was wrong. Got to refine my process. Okay, now we're getting better close to the right. And that's what you want to get in kids immediately. And then they can do whatever they want. Yeah. And how much does physicality obviously you're you're probably biased you're a boxer so how much does the physical <laughs> aspect of their upbringing um affect their transition into this warrior amongst state so i i remember listening to i think it was a podcast where you were talking about intuition was it one of the podcasts yes yeah and the way you described it it made him sound and you're a boxer so it made it sound like like you were like a, a ninja or a samurai or some shit <laughs> and it was very impressive because it's i mean it's all the same it's martial arts right and it's all you know fighting in that that zen you know in that state they call it the void where nothing uh -huh. exists except like your you know your training and your reactions so how how much how important would be would it be to get them you know started on you know physicality because i would i would want my girls you know start martial arts quite early okay. in some form okay so so there's so i mean There's so many advantages. There are no disadvantages, but that's how many advantages there are. All of them, infinity, right? Mm. And there are zero disadvantages. But the biggest reasons, why right, the, the the most important reasons to get children started on a a physically fit lifestyle. One, the discipline aspect is key. Physical fitness is one of those things where um, you kind of got to do it. You got to make a schedule for it, and it forces you to encounter a difficult thing. It's kind of like a middle ground between, like, someone's postmodern truth is always right and something super hard and rigorous like, like calculus. It's difficult, but there are many ways to do it. But the important thing is it's difficult. So it's going to make you better and it's going to teach you how to deal with difficult things towards a goal. That is the biggest thing for me. Because um, too many people, I can't tell you how many times I hear people go, man, running just hurts, man. It just sucks. And no matter how often I do it, I'm like, you're missing the point. It's always going to hurt. Until you get to that weird point where you like addicted to the, to the endorphins. But even then, you got to be in pain to feel endorphins, right? Yeah. Uh, So, so it's never going to feel good. You got to learn to run through that pain, to work with that pain, to perform and to do a thing that you know is good for you running in spite of the pain. This goes back to that delayed gratification thing. You know, to if, am I going to give in because it feels good to stop running and get fat or am I going to keep running and stay in shape and keep my health high? I mean, the health is obvious, right? Why you want to keep them fit? So, I, so I'm gonna ignore that. But we'll just throw it out there. Health, big one, very obvious. The other reason you want to make sure 
that they that they stay physically fit is I guess the best word for this is blood flow, right? They want to be able to learn. And you can just learn better when you're in better shape. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. But but as a biology teacher I had in high school once said, good genes come in clusters. Uh, in other words, it is it is very rare. Or, or I mean, whether it's true or not, his, his point was you don't want to be fat, sloppy, overweight, but have an IQ of 150, right? No one wants that. Likewise, you don't want to be gorgeous, but be dumb as a doornail. You don't want that either. Mm. You want to, and I think what he was trying to express, or rather what I've taken from it, is that both things feed into each other. They help. So you want to be fit to learn. There's the confidence aspect. This is, you know, and, and I don't know, like, how how a parent, because I'm not a parent yet, how a parent feels about discussing this particular aspect, but, but it is important to the development of a human being in general. When a person is confident, when they, when they don't feel like they are outcast from the world, they're likely to carry healthier thoughts, which in and of itself is good, but it serves as an inoculation against horrible thoughts. You know, and, and the degree of horrible or self injuring or self denigrating it can go from as, as mild as self talk as to extreme as like suicide and everything in between. But you want to foster a healthy person. And you can do all you can building the environment. But the other part is the person eventually will form a self-image. And that self-image will come from their interactions with every other person and how other people are seen. If they grow up, as they will, and see overweight people and how overweight people are, are mocked in the media and, and treated certain ways and rejected by attention, they want to build an image uh, that is not overweight. That they don't want to see themselves as the fat person or the, or the slow person or the weak person. Physically fit people probably, I mean, I'm, this is not scientific at all. This is just an intuitive guess. Probably rate higher on self-esteem. Uh, and if they don't, I would be surprised. And I'm sure it's probably for another reason. But it, we can say it's not because they look at themselves and think, man, I'm just too in shape, man. This is awful. I'm just too good looking. This is miserable. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't happen. So, so for me, those are the, the big three reasons. You want to build uh, an ability to do hard things and work through hard things and understand that that pain won't kill you, that, that tolerance, that grit, that endurance. You want to build a strong self-image, and that comes from having uh, an image that you like, right? And it also, you also want to just have a better blood flow, a better system to help you learn to, so you don't have to worry about that. I mean, and remember, you know, and I'm sure there's somebody out there listening, in case it wasn't obvious, health is the number one reason, you know, the healthier you are, the better life you're going to have. But that's so obvious and so clear. I didn't, I didn't want to like harp, but we can talk about, you know, health forever. What made you? Uh, what made you choose boxing over? Say, I guess it was it was it just logistics that it was immediately available in where you where you live, or uh, in terms of the sport I chose and why I chose it. Um, so I always was interested in boxing. That's like the we let's go do a thing that I want to always try. That is there, but but remember, I'm a competitive person for myself and. I'm also practical. And for the first year of training, I did everything. I did I was in jitsu, boxing, kickboxing, and judo for a year. As I learned the systems and I learned the, you know, what I could learn. And here's what I figured out. We're early real fast. One, I'm not big enough to be great at MMA. Or rather, I'm the wrong body type to be great at MMA. I'm not quite big enough to be a heavyweight in MMA. And I'm not quite small enough to consistently but strongly get down to 205. Mm. So there's that. 
Um, there is no money in jujitsu and judo. Period. That is just our kickboxing. Those are just things you do because you like them. You ain't never gonna be rich. No one will probably know about you outside the community, and that's if you get a black belt, which will take minimum ten years, right? Uh, but boxing was interesting when I looked at boxing, and it came down to what I was gonna do full time boxing in MMA. Boxing has this amateur tradition, which is rich. You can go to the Olympics in boxing. You can win tournaments in boxing. You can eventually make money in boxing, right? Same with MMA. Difference is there's no amateur development system that's organized. Mm. The structure and order of boxing also appealed to me. Mm. The body type. I'm still a bit mismatched body type. Look, this is going to be this one's like the weirdest. Huh? You're on the cusp, right? You're like uh, one of those Mike. I am. Types. Yeah, I'm in this weird. I'm in this weird at, at place. I'm in. I'm in great shape, even right now. Not training hard because I don't have a fight coming up. Just going to the gym maybe three or four days a week. Uh, the boxing gym, anyhow. Uh, I'm walking around a 220 with like 12 percent body fat. Mm. That is a miserable place to be. Um, because I'm and I'm six one. This is going to sound odd, right? 6'1 is short. For taller than 90% of the population, for heavyweight boxing, heavyweight boxing, that's short. Mm. At 220, that's small. <laughs> uh, now, yeah, now a lot of people a lot of people say, why don't you cut back to, to uh, cruiser rate? Okay, that's not a bad idea, except I'm already, I'm not walking around with that. Wait, like a, a cut is possible, but dear God, I like. I, I mean, to be honest, I just don't think I can get the two two hundred one. Even when I was cutting for MMA, the lightest I got was two hundred five. Like right on the cusp, boom, waiting that day, two hundred five mm. for for light heavyweight MMA. I mean, you just, I'm in a hard body type for for boxing. Mm. Um, but that's where I'm at. But 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 eventually, I decided to go with boxing because while it's hard, it's not as hard as MMA. In terms of where my body type puts me, because there's not a ground dimension. You get rid of that ground dimension, then it becomes a lot more about things I can't control: my athleticism, my speed, my strength, mm. my technique. MMA, man, that ground dimension, being able to get on top of a guy and kicking, total game changer. Boxing, I got to worry about what two, uh, three dimensions, mm. I guess, or, or three, three different ways to attack me. In terms of your completeness as a fighter, though, you, I mean, I think you're you're approaching boxing as um, as a it's 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 uh you're you're approaching boxing as a martial artist, but you're also approaching it from a practical standpoint in terms of your own in terms of your whole life and in terms of self improvement, right? Right, right. Because I'm not I'm very fortunate, and you know, this is one of the things I thought about after my loss. I learned about a lot of things. Oh wow, uh, that's my cat, cat man. They yeah. back in you know, full. Uh, <laughs> we, have but, two uh, cats. we have two cats as well. The one yeah, of them I got is, two yeah, cats, man. Everything. They be, I don't want they. She gonna be mad as hell about that, but that's cool. <laughs> uh, it's cats, not me. Yeah. Um, back back to what I was saying. I'm very fortunate in that <clears throat> I am intelligent enough to do other things. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right? Because the money in boxing isn't great. You know, I let people think what they want to think. I mean, I'm, I'm, let's put it like this. I'm sitting here right now talking to you, and I didn't have to worry about waking up and going to work. Right. right. Um, now, now, now how, how great it is after that is, you know, irrelevant. But the point is, even my position is relatively rare. I mean, there's only a few guys in boxing that make any kind of money. Really, because you know, there's only a few number of TV dates, and TV is where the money comes, and you got to keep winning. When you lose once, you know your life. Like my life is gonna be hard now. Thank goodness I can do other things. Mm. I'm rather relatively hard compared to how it's been for the past two years in the development of my, my boxing career. Is it impossible? No. But 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 let's say let's say I wake up tomorrow and I'm like, this some bullshit, mm. right? I can just go. <laughs> I can do a number of other things. I'm not too stressed about that. Boxing and how it plays in the whole scheme of this is I take it very seriously. 
So seriously, because you can't do boxing and not take it seriously. You can't. Nobody plays boxing. That's mm-hmm. what. I don't know if you ever seen a movie Undisputed with Ving Rhames, but uh, they they asked Ving Rhames in an interview before he goes, "What's the difference between boxing and other sports?" And he goes, first of all, nobody plays boxing, I, and he's right. That. right? <laughs> That's the one where he's in with Wesley Snipes, right? Yeah, in jail, yeah, yeah, and they the have first one, yeah, the first yeah. one. Yeah. So it's great. One of my, one of my. Uh, I mean, I like Ving Rhames. Then time you get a badass on on the screen, but uh, yeah. But 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 because of the seriousness I take it, or the serious attention I give it, it has developed me. I am a better. There is no way, shape, or there's no if ands or buts about it. I'm a better person because of boxing. Mm. I'm a better person in every single way, tangible and intangible. I do not know. I mean, maybe I would have improved. Who knows, right? Mm. But I know the things I've done to make my career better and to to kind of be an example to people around me because I don't want to... That's like To me, that's a horrible thing to do to have any kind of influence and waste it. Uh, so, so I really like what it's done. And I'm going to keep fighting. I mean... I know what I know when I, I know what my limit for not fighting is. Like, like if I, if I lost my next fight and guys were like, "Yo, we want you to come in here for five grand against this dude that's twenty and zero to be an opponent," I'm like, "Yeah, y'all can keep that five grand. I'm going to school, man." Like, <laughs> like, hey, like it's just not, you know. And and, and you got to remember, there are a lot of guys who who get into fighting because they they think it might be something easy. They might think there's money. They got nothing else. I am in none of those categories, and a lot of it is because of the way I see the world that I took to boxing, and then what I took from boxing, I applied to the rest of the world. So, so does that man? But but we'll, but we'll see. Um, I I really like though. Like overall, boxing has made me a better human being. To to sum that up. Mm. Now you've got a you've got a few books that have been published, right? I'm going to talk about the ebook first. So he's got Ed Latimer has got three books out. Uh, one of them is an ebook that you can download from his website if you sign up to his mailing list, and the other two are one of them is a is a poetry book. And if you are if you are a Muslim and you have any experience with our sacred tradition, you understand the concept of the book. He talk he 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 puts a poem in there and he explains the poem. And then the, the third one is like, uh, I guess, uh, um, <laughs> is How to Catch and Kill a Crackhead, which is like, I guess, a fiction piece. Um, yeah. And this is what I mean about Ed being a writer as a craft rather than just something he does as a hobby, because you need to really like writing to come up with a book title like, you know, How to Catch oh, and Kill man. a Crackhead. <laughs> to make a story on that, too, dude. I mean, it is, it is good. My, the, my sense of humor, first of all, is like, yeah, all the horrible things I grew up with and saw, I just found a way to laugh about them, right? Hey. I saw a lot of crackheads. I lived next door to a crack dealer. One time, I was babysat by a crackhead, and I was too young to understand what that what crack was, but <laughs> but I learned later that was crack they were smoking around me, right? Now, now a lot of people could let that destroy them. Yeah, I just not have made jokes about it, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I'll, I'll never forget one. I always had this idea about this book and all these stories I've been telling people that were funny. And I always put a comedic twist on it because I don't believe in being a downer. I believe in being an upper. You know, people should want to have me around. Uh, and, and I did. I was like 21 and I did a research study and I got a bunch of money for it. I got like like six grand for the study. And and so I was like, let me invest this. And so I wrote the book, and then I, I paid for the editing, and I I, I hired a guy out of, out of University of Pittsburgh to do the artwork. I got so much artwork for this thing in a book, and these posts I got, and uh, and I put it together, and I just been floating out there. And remember, I did this ten years ago before there was any way to really build a following like there is now. Now I just put it on my website, right, and it sells copies. But uh, the book is just just a fictional account of like how crackheads came to be, mm. how you can protect yourself, and then how to kill one if you encounter one. <laughs> that's, uh, that's hilarious, man. I think your, your your work is a little bit too cheaply priced, man. I would put them up at ten dollars at least. You know, it's it's, it's, it's oh right. man. <laughs> you, have, I mean, you have a following that I mean, 
ten dollars ain't that much to buy a book, and I, I think you people could learn a lot from it. So if you get just one real good insight, it's more than worth the money. Yeah. yeah now the next easy. book, the next book will be priced at ten. The one the heavyweight insights because yeah. I put a lot, I mean a lot of energy into that yeah. book, and I'm really proud of it. Like like I got back the first edits from my. Um, from my editor, uh, and my latest piece actually is is a sample from the book. It's like you know, mm. the the hard um, hard work beats talent. That's from yeah. the, from the book. I just read that's actually morning. a combination of two posts, but but that one will be priced at ten, and I'm gonna like legitimately market that one mm. because I think that book is is going to not only like first of all everyone that like reads me and likes my stuff, they they should buy it because they'll really enjoy it. Yeah. But also, like, I think it's going to expand and let people be able to find out about me who didn't know about me. that book. And I, I and my that's already done. That's being edited. And then once I get all the edits back, the final ones, you know, I'll, I'll get uh, Matt Lawrence. Oh, he's on Twitter to, to do the real cover. The the, the, the two cover, the, the covers for the, he did the, the four confidence cover because mm-hmm. that's one I really care about. Mm. Uh, the crackhead cover that was actually already done. I just hired a guy. To, uh, to touch it up with color to it, yeah. and the Twitter post inside same deal because it was the Twitter logo. Yeah. It was a five dollar piece off Fiverr, but this one I'm gonna get him to come and bring the big guns, and it's really gonna be a, a solid piece. Mm. But uh, the, the other one I'm writing about is uh, uh, right now the working title is Selective Sobriety. I wanted to write. A, I wanted to write about my experiences giving up alcohol, and particularly like how to live a life that way, and also how to exist as a young person in this because this is not the second time i went to alcohol i also stopped drinking when i from 19 to 23 i didn't drink uh so i, I spent half my 20s drinking half my 20s not drinking um and i think it's hard I, I think you know they don't talk about this and this is really important to me this is what happens when you think and you read between the lines whenever there are these, these assaults on campus with these girls who get involved in these situations and say they were raped or or assaulted by God, I always think, and it's horrible I think this way, but it's important to think about it, was there alcohol involved? You know, I think think the percentage of the population that are like legitimate, we should bury these dudes under the prison after we castrate them rapists, Mm. I think it's a very small percentage of the population that goes around preying on girls. Drunk or sober. Yeah. I think what happens is alcohol removes a lot of your inhibitions and it makes you think things are a good idea that aren't, makes you misinterpret things, makes you get in situations that you shouldn't be. And uh and so a lot of these guys that would never do something crazy, they get on that alcohol and they 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 they, they assault the girl and the girl is drunk too. Mm. And that does not excuse it. But she sobers up and she goes, yo, that was a soul. And now, you know, you didn't done some dumb shit. Now you got to live with it the rest of your life. It's like it's the same idea. You know, people bitch about this. And I think my stance is a little softer because I want everyone to win. I, I don't want girls to get a soul. I don't want dudes to go away for being jackasses. Yeah. And I see the comments and I'm at her being that booze. But it's like driving a car. I don't think most people are murderers. But if you give somebody booze and they get behind the wheel of a car, they they might hit somebody and kill somebody. Now they're going to do some serious time for involuntary manslaughter, and they're going to be killers for the rest of their lives. Yeah, and seen that way. So, so I really want to write. That's, that's such an important topic to me, and it's kind of been my side project to write about living a life where maybe you don't even go completely sober, but to get away from this binge drinking culture that we've cultivated that has caused so many more problems and no one discusses no one discusses that like they always talk about the assault aspect no one wants to discuss how in every single situation there is an excessive alcohol consumption mm. and I'm like Man, you're not going to touch that that's important like and how long how long have you been sober like 3 years now right or was it 2 years It'll be it'll be three years. We're coming up on three years. December twenty third. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, Ed Ed, Ed like quit drinking uh, drinking alcohol and he's written about it on his website. And he's got some really cool posts about his insights about how his life improved after he 
sort of quit uh, drinking alcohol. Um, let me move on to your book on confidence. Now, this is, uh, I, I mean, I, lo- I read it, um, um, I think I've read it like uh, one and a half times. And oh. <laughs> I love this book. So, because these, the four confidences, it mimics a lot of what we have in our, in our sacred tradition when uh, a student decides to uh, start studying Islam formally. Uh, so, uh, why don't you just go ahead and summarize the, the four confidences for, for the audience. It's confidence in the process, confidence in the instruction, confidence in the past, and confidence in, the, in learning. And this is like some, some mind-blowing stuff, actually. Yeah. So, so confidence is like work experience. You know, you go and look for a job and they go, well, we want to hire somebody with three years experience. And you're like, yo, how am I supposed to get experience if you won't hire me? Mm. So you're, you're stuck in this weird loop. And I think confidence is the same way. You need to succeed out of something to have confidence. But oftentimes your success is contingent upon you confidently doing what you need to do. So how do you get confidence to do things to build other confidence? So what the book does is it explores the four areas that I think are key or the four places to put your confidence. You can be confident in the process. And that is if, if I tell you, here's what you need to do to bake a cake. Get some flour, some eggs, some sugar, et cetera. And you ain't never baked a cake before. What you are confident in is the recipe and that it has produced cake for many people other times. So you don't have to worry about being confident that you're a good cook. You just have to be confident that you can read a recipe and follow directions, right? So you're confident in the process. Using that analogy and continue baking cake. First thing that came to mind, don't even eat cake. Don't know why I did. Um, if you have the next thing you can be confident in, you never baked a cake before, but you want to learn to bake a cake. And so you go to a class or you look on a video on YouTube and you got a teacher. And the teacher says, hey, I didn't taught a lot of other people how to bake cake. I'm going to teach you how to bake cake. Now you don't have to worry about being confident that you're a cook. You don't need self-confidence. You can go, oh, man, this guy has made some great cooks. He's going to make me a great cook. I can just be confident that if I listen to him, I will make good cake. Now, if you can't get a teacher and you you can't read or whatever, who knows, right? The next uh, place you can be confident is that you have followed directions before and an outcome, a favorable outcome occur because you followed those directions. So there's the confidence in, in uh, the, the what did, I can't remember my own words. What did I say? God, I got the idea, right? Yeah, so confidence in the instruction. In the instruction, right. Now so you are, there are the past, confidence in the past, right? right. So if you have in the past, followed directions and had a favorable outcome now you can have confidence that you can do that again mm. it's one more place to put your confidence until you develop this self-confidence and the last one confidence in the learning in the learning this is for some of uh, some of the people out there who might uh be a little nerdy about one thing or have great skill in something else that they want to transmute or I'll translate to another area. If you know you've learned how to play piano before, if you know that you've learned how to write a computer program, then you should be able, but you feel intimidated by stuff in the kitchen, you should be able to go, no, 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 no. I learned how to play a piano, man. I can learn how to bake this cake. I'm going to say how I'm going to bake this cake. So those are the four areas you put confidence in Uh Till you build your own self confidence, and then you don't. Now you got that. Now you've got the confidence to do a new thing or to do something. And everyone, everyone who can read the book. That means if someone has enough experience in life to where they can read words. So like even up even as young as like six or eight, right? They can read the book unaided. Then they have had experience in those four areas. And so they can lean back on it and become confident in the future in other areas. And I, and I, I mentioned that, you know, it completely mim- mimics the process of a student, you know, studying something. Uh, let's take martial arts, for example, or, you know, studying religion. 
it completely mimics the process from beginner to master, right? It's like right. you know, it's it's pa- the the instruction is passed down from you know teacher to student over generations, hundreds of years, right? And it's probably the same in boxing as well. So you start off as a neophyte boxer, and you decide the the process is I'm going to go to the boxing gym and find an instructor, and then you go find the good instructor who's made a lot of good boxers, and then you just trust him with the process. And you trust him in the fact that he's made a lot of good boxers. And then as you progress, you have confidence that, you know, you you following his instructions has led to you getting better and better. And then eventually, if you master boxing, now you all want to go learn uh, Muay Thai, you yeah. have the confidence that you can follow that same process again. And it's, and you know, and I came up with the book because... A lot of confidence advice is highly um, tactical. It tells you to do things. And those things are specific to perhaps a skill or area. And I was like, I don't I don't like this because uh, I don't feel like it actually solves the problem. It doesn't it doesn't let you it assumes that you'll take a leap of faith. Right. So I wanted to focus on ways that you could develop confidence that don't require leaps of faith. That lean on things that have already demonstrated success. And so those are the four ideas I came up with. It's a system, right, that you can apply to anything in life rather than just a bunch of tactics. Yes. And, and that was important to me. I didn't want to just write about confidence in talking to girls or confidence in boxing or how to get confidence to give a presentation. Mm-hmm. No, no, because the, 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 there are subtle but key differences in each thing. And I can't cover everything. Uh, I can't cover the infinity. You know, that's why you have a formula, right? Formula is you just plug stuff in and it works. And I think this is a good formula for building confidence. Right, right, exactly. Now let's talk about this uh, this poetry book. This is I'm gonna just read a few of them, some of the good ones. This one's called okay. the Fundamentals. Uh, Ed writes, "Speed is overrated. Fundamentals are overlooked. Patience is no longer a virtue. For these reasons, you'll never be good." There's another one called Stoic. Even if you ventured and nothing was gained. Still your tongue and never complain. If you want to remain sane, change the world or it stays the same. That in life which makes you cry cannot be handled if you never try. And the courageous. A strong heart with a weak mind gets taken advantage of many times. A strong mind with a weak heart makes one craft plans they never start. I mean, a lot of these things, they seem... They seem, you know, like uh, simple or common sense, but I, I guess a lot of that simplicity and common sense has gotten lost in, you know, um, right. the, the information overload that we face in life. So tell us about this, you know, this poetry book. Where did you get the idea from for this for this book? Uh, so the book was just a section of the bigger book, the Heavyweight Insight, because the the bigger book uh, we I took all of my tweets and then I took my best tweets and then I broke my best tweets down into categories and there was this category, this category of poetry, right? Where I I intentionally was trying to craft a poem. That wasn't an accident. What is an accident, you know, is perhaps some of the deeper meaning or not the deeper meaning, but uh, there was no accident. It was very intentional. I was trying to create a work of poetry, right? Um, and when I finished it, when I wrote it and I got back uh, the second round of edits, I was like, man, there's just no, this just doesn't fit with the theme of the book. Uh, I guess I could, what am I going to do with it? I just took it out. But I still had this wonderful material, so I made a book of it. And so each, the point of like the larger book that comes out, there's a, a tweet and an explanation and an actionable step. And as you see in the book, there's a tweet, the poem, 
the explanation and then an actionable set of advice, a thing you could do to reiterate the idea in your life that each poem, you know, kind of captures. So that's where that idea came from. The original, and I was like, man, I got this Twitter book, I got these poems, they're 140 characters, it's a short read. I think people will really uh, enjoy this and get stuff out of it. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. Why don't you why don't you explain this one to us? Uh, I think this will be a good one. The hardest part for the newly woke is letting sleeping dogs lie. The hardest part for the red pill taker is not to give up and cry. Ah, so so this is like um, <laughs> I don't know if you ever seen the Matrix. Yeah. But in the Matrix, uh, you know, he wakes up and he sees the world for what it really is, and. They tell him, yo, once you see it, you can't go back, man. And he's like, oh, okay, whatever. Well, it's horrible. I mean, it's absolutely terrible, right? <laughs> and but they also but they also tell him, we also don't like to wake people up, especially not people that have been in for too long because you know the mind's just too used to other things. So, you know, when we use that analogy of the red pill and this waking up. To, to seeing what's really going on in the world and things they don't want you to fully understand are systems that benefit from your ignorance is a better way to put it. And the red pill is when you take them and you understand that system and, and now you're no longer ignorant. And, and the first thing that any human being wants to do when they learn something new, especially something helpful, is they want to tell the people closest to them, at the very least, maybe everyone, but at the very least, the problem is, like he says in the Matrix, is that you know most of the people are too are, are so hopelessly uh, inert in the system that not only do they not want to wake up, but they're going to view you as an enemy mm -hmm. because you you know like what are you talking about? Get out of here! This is, this is crazy. What do you, what do you what do you mean? Uh, well, what's a what's a, a good, my favorite one? Oh, what do you mean? It doesn't matter who the president is, right? That, that I really, you know, I believe that. With it. <laughs> it's crazy out here. I'm gonna vote. You're you're crazy for not voting, <laughs> right? Right, right, exactly. Um, so so that's the first step is when you when you first wake up, you want to tell everyone, but no one wants to wake up. They just want to stay asleep. The next part is when you look around and you see just how awful things are and you know I, you see a lot of guys get like this and like the like in a dating world you see a lot of this right um guys go holy shit it is actually it's a it's a doggy dog world out here man it's just nuts i don't want anything to do with it <laughs> yeah and, and so they give up a lot of that do the men go in their own way i right. think that's the MGTOW. acronym make tell yeah yeah, they, they, they're like, yo, I'm out. Peace. I'm like, wow. And that is a direct response, or rather a direct reaction of, of seeing how things really work and going, well, do I want to play this game or do I not want to play this? No, I don't want to play this game anymore. Right. So the, the, that's where that came from. And that general idea, I think, applies to, uh, to anything. When you learn something that is true, it's like, it, like even like kids, right? Go tell a kid. That first kid who learns that Santa Claus ain't real <laughs> wants to tell the other kids. The other kids are like, get out of here. Who's going to bring my presents? You're crazy. And then they go tell mom. Mom's just saying Santa Claus isn't real. <laughs> You're an enemy now. You're trying to. You're trying to. Yeah. And I think it's not. And it's, this is not just from the Matrix. Right? This is more. Uh, uh, has a lot to do with, uh, you know, the red pill and being woke and stuff like that. Um which is where a lot of these uh, self improvement, you know, uh, blogs and uh, come from, personalities yeah. come from. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, I guess the red pill is sort of a reaction to the state, you know, that has, you know, the gender dynamic state in the West between feminists and non feminists, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, because, because here's the thing. Here's the thing people don't get. This is this is taking it a step further, looking behind the curtains. Yeah. You gotta remember something. Women should have equal rights because they're human beings. Mm. Right? All human beings should share the same 
right? I mean, unless they've been convicted or whatever, and that's a different thing. But the, but the whole but that is like the first wave feminism, right? That they talk about when women were trying to get rights to vote and not get the shit beat out by their husbands, like things like that. Okay. Yeah. But then something something interesting happened. They got those things, the right to vote, all those. And I think a really smart movement never wants equality. A smart movement wants absolute power. Mm. And you, I mean, you can see that everywhere. I mean, you got to remember we we live in an era it was where where affirmative action is a thing. I really hate the concept of affirmative action because God forbid my doctor got into med school to fill a quota. <laughs> you know, it's just not diversity for diversity's sake is never a good idea. But that soft subject. But um, but that's what happens to 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 start seizing power advantages. Mm. And I don't think guys realize that's why they're so angry at this new wave of feminism. And because they don't understand that, it comes off like they hate women, like they want to put women back in the kitchen because they don't know how to distinguish what they're angry at versus what they're not angry at. I don't think, I mean, and maybe I'm being a little naive and, and optimistic, but I don't think there is... Any God that wants women to be subjugated or to not have opportunities available to men. I don't think that. However, I don't think there's any God that wants a woman's word to have more weight than his uh, in something as critical as like a false or or, let's not call it false, a rape accusation, right? Yeah. I don't. I don't think there's any God that, that feels comfortable with the idea. Okay, as long as she said it happened, we should just believe her, right? Mm. I don't think there's any God that's comfortable with the state of the the child. I mean, never mind the fact that you had kids with somebody you're not going to stay with, right? Mm. Let's forget that. But, but you get to that point and how the courts award custody automatically. Almost, I think. I think ninety percent of the time, somewhere up there, automatically. I don't think God's like that, mm. right? So. I don't think guys like the whole idea of no fault divorce that are initiated by 70, 77% of the time, last time I read, yeah. by women. That is an overwhelming uh, statistic. The alimony, man, I told my girl I love her to death, but if she, she hits me, if we get married and she hits me with alimony, I'll sit here and do the math for how long I'll be alive. I might kill her. <laughs> you know, how serious I am about that depends on how much money I'm making at the time. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we never get to that point to find out. <laughs> All right. Yeah, but right. the point is exactly the point is guys are angry at the power shift because it is not equal. And anyone that tells you that's the best. That is the greatest trick any movement has ever pulled to make you believe they're still fighting for rights. Mm-hmm. And so every victory Every situation is put under the guise of, well, we're fighting for rights, man. You gotta, you gotta give it to us, right? It's like they're moving so, the goalposts, right? Every time. They yes. Do yeah. 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 And eventually, eventually, the goalpost is is right there, is on the ten yard line. But 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 your ten yard line, not theirs. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're like, wow, well, that happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so. That, I think, is what guys are angry about. Guys aren't angry about feminism. The clash isn't women should have rights, et cetera, et cetera. The clash, I mean, and then there's, like, these crazy expectations, you know, and, and whether you agree or disagree with them is up in the air, but but I understand the disagreement, the discord, like like the whole dating situation, right? You know, how, how now, like... Uh, Women expect to be asked out, but not pay for anything, and that's cool. But you gotta understand, there was a system in place for that. A god could ask you out on a date, like a legit date, not Netflix and chill, and and not expect to get slubbed. So, or at the very least, not expect to get slubbed, and then have you go Netflix and chill with a god the next day. Mm-hmm. Like, there was a set of expectations. And those expectations were kind of a balance system. Whenever you disrupt that balance or upset it, you get 
you get revolution, you get discord, you get this unhappiness, you know. And I, I think that's what people were seeing now, that the clash. So there was there was like a, a social contract that existed and then one side broke that social contract while expecting the other to uphold it. And what yes. you see now is there's a reaction to that. Absolutely. Um because you could only look you could only look if it's one thing history teaches us time and time and time again is you can only treat a group of people unfairly for so long. Mm-hmm. And, and um and you know what group that is or how unfair it is 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 up to individual debate and interpretation. But the point is, as a group, people don't like when the when the balance is shifted. They don't like when they give and not get. You know that that's one of the people forget this. The whole reason, <laughs> the whole reason the husband and wife system was even created was because the dudes with power they were taking out of chicks. Mm-hmm. But the dudes with power didn't want to work, and the other dudes were like, "Why should I work? I'm not even going to get a woman out of this." So they had to figure out a way to build a civilization. They're like, "Okay, okay, okay. Here's this is what we'll do," you know. <laughs> So, but well, that, but that's the general idea, and and people, the guys just want a fair shake. But so do women. Both sides want a fair shake. But but as I always say, there is a lot more money in keeping you invest in problems you can't change than there is in making you focus on problems you can change. There, for example, like like back we were talking about with the uh, the alcohol on campus, everyone wants to focus on the sexual assault. And while that's terrible, how preventable is it if we focus on the thing we can't change? Well, look, we can't we we can't change teenage hormonal tendencies and what alcohol does to them. What we can change is how much alcohol we we give them. Mm-hmm. But but there's no there's no um no benefit, no money in talking about that. If anything, people lose money, right? right. Uh, in terms of the law, the overtime needed for the law enforcement and the money made from the alcohol companies to sell it, and the, the, the money that lawyers make in the litigation. Mm-hmm. Oh man, it, there, there's a huge racket. I never even thought about that until now. How big the racket has to be to keep certain um, systems of inequality, or rather, certain systems under the illusion that they're being, you know, chained. People ain't changing. But because you don't, you're not having them focus on the things they can change. Likewise, the interaction between men and women it won't it, will, it, it won't change with guys yelling about feminism. It won't change with girls talking about mansplaining. None of that'll change. It won't change with comedians doing their bits about stuff that half of us don't think are funny. None of it will change. It won't, it won't change until we decide, okay, here's what we can do a thing about. Let's, let's focus on that. So back to the example thing, man. I, I, I can't talk about this if I'm out there running the streets, man. Like, that, it, it doesn't make sense. I don't like, I, I just don't want to be part of that life. I mean, it ain't, it ain't for me, <laughs> you know? Not at all. Right. I think that's a that's a good, good place to uh, end the conversation because we brought it back full circle. It's all about you know, working on yourself and improving yourself and improving the people around you through uh, a yeah. reflection of your own self improvement. How long we been talking? We've been not, uh, not counting the technical. So that's a, almost uh, almost two hours of content now. So this one is getting on one one and a half hours. The previous one was twenty minutes. Um, so why don't you oh, why don't man, you let the people know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we lost track of time. Why don't you let the people know where they can find you? and how they can support your work you can find me at ed ed latimore l-a-t-i-m-o-r-e ed latimore.com and that's my twitter handle ed latimore and if you want to support me and help me <laughs> you can buy some books but it won't make much of a difference uh until i sell thousands of books so you should buy the book because you think my writing that you see on the blog will help you. And and that's how it should always be. I try and put value out, and I feel like if I keep putting value out, value somehow will come back to me. When is your uh, your bigger book uh, uh, dropping? Well, that's that's called The Quotable Boxer, is it? 
it was called the quotable boxer, and I had a, a conversation with a guy who made some really good points that I agreed with. And so uh, the title I'm going with now is Heavyweight Insights. Mm-hmm. And, when and that works well. Because I'm, um, well, once I get back to the final edits, I'll have a, a clear schedule. I'd like to get it out before 2017. I really hope that's going to be possible. If not, you know, I might have to. <laughs> who knows what I because it's not because now I'm not the bottleneck anymore now it's the uh, the um, the editor mm-hmm. so and once I get it back I still got to like format it in a uh, scrivener and put it together but that won't take time that's easy work yeah uh, so hopefully before I hope before Christmas I wish I could give you a definite date <laughs> but uh send uh, send me a review copy and I'll I'll uh, I'll promote it on my blog. Uh, thank you very much, man. Thank you very uh, much. I'm I'm a I'm a huge fan of your work, and I enjoy your writing. And I'm I'm actually amazed at sort of the insights that you have, being as young as you are. I think it comes with the 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 <laughs> the, the extent of life experience that you have uh, in being, you know, uh, being, coming out of the hood and you know being a boxer and being a university student and things like that. So I wish you all the success. Thank you so much for your time. Um, this is hey, hey thank, thank you so much for your time. Two hours, man. I, I hope you edited. I don't. <laughs> no, this is going up raw. I don't have time to cut, splice it together, man. It's like it's too much hassle. Woo, I'm just going to eat it. But it was all. I think it was all legit. Uh, you know, valuable content. So thank you very much. Uh, Here you go. That was Ed Lattimore, physicist, author, boxer, and wise beyond his years. Uh, I thought it was interesting that when I asked him to, you know, describe the warrior monk and how we would sort of engineer that kind of character, he started with the spiritual, he started with the mental, he started with the internal characteristics uh, as opposed to the external. Now, the external are important, but I think it's not that surprising considering that he's a, a fighter and a martial artist and just a generally a cerebral person. I think you'll find a lot of parallels between, you know, the thinking of these kinds of individuals and our own tradition. You found me referring again and again to examples within our tradition, like the verse of the Quran, Allah just does not change the condition of, of a people until they change that which is within themselves. And this is a common re- recurring feature of all of these self-improvement movements, whatever their, you know, um, background and affiliation. If you enjoy listening to this podcast, please leave me a rating and review on Stitcher and iTunes. I'll leave the links in the uh, description and on the blog post when this goes up. More ratings and reviews means that I know that there are people listening and enjoying this content and it will encourage me to create more content like this in the future. Thank you very much for listening. This is Nabil Aziz of the Becoming the Alpha Muslim podcast and becoming the alpha signing off assalamu alaikum